This is Stonehenge in Wiltshire. It's a very important monument, not only because it's managed to survive for 3,000 years since it was built, but also it seems to prove that whoever constructed it had a knowledge of the stars. These stones seem to have been placed in positions that relate to our star, the sun, and the stone that stands alone is the key. The mathematical accuracy of this heel stone's position, along with other stones, lining up with midsummer moonrises and midwinter sunsets, has led some scientists to claim that this, Stonehenge, is actually a solar observatory. Once a year, on Midsummer's Day, the sun rises directly over this heel stone. Whoever built Stonehenge must have discovered how to predict the sun's path across the sky. That knowledge opened up a whole new world. Setting sail for distant lands in the past used to be dangerous. These days, modern technology helps point the way. But in the old days, how could you tell where you were with just the sun, the stars and endless sea? As a, a skipper of a modern boat, we have lots of navigation equipment, electronics to rely on. We have a Decker navigator here, which gives us a constant update of where we are all the time. Of course, years ago, in the olden days, they didn't have this sort of sophisticated equipment. They had to use a sextant. They used to find out where they were by looking at the moon and the sun and the stars. So if we take the sextant up on deck with us, we'll be able to have a look at the sun and see what we can do with it. Let's go. Want to follow me? In the past, this would have been routine. They checked the position of the sun several times during the day to make sure they were on course. It looks like quite a fragile piece of equipment. It's a, it's a very precise piece of equipment. We use it to measure the angle between the sun and the horizon so we can work out where we are. These are shades, obviously to shade your eye from the sun. We're just aiming to sit the sun on the horizon. Yeah and then we take the reading off the, off the scale on the side. OK, can I have a go? Certainly. Thank there you. you go. I found it quite difficult to hold it steady enough to get a reading, even though the sea was quite calm. And I just with this fine tune. That's right, at the end here. OK, what was the, what was the reading? We've got 34 degrees exactly. That's pretty spot on. So right. what do we do with it now, then? Well, we can go through some complicated calculations and then we should come up with a line on the chart. OK. And after all that, we still only had a rough idea of where we were. All we've discovered is that we're somewhere along this line here. We can use the sextant on stars as well, can't we? Yes, the really good thing about using the stars is that by using three or four stars uh, in the same way as we use the sun, we end up with four position lines and all the lines that we produce should cross in a very small area so we know exactly whereabouts we are. Measuring the position of both the sun and the stars meant that sailors could always work out exactly where they were. Voyages became safer as sailors were confident of their route, but their calculations had to rely on accurate maps of the night sky. To find out who began accurately mapping the stars, I've had to come here, to the old Royal Observatory in Greenwich. <laughs> The building dates back 300 years. It was specially built for astronomers, the people who spent their working lives making the maps. In those days, being an astronomer was a pretty laid-back job. Most of the time was spent on one of these. How long did it take to make the maps? Well, the first astronomer who worked here 
spent 40 years just on the task of plotting the position of the stars. So that's an amazingly long time. Uh, the, the astronomer who came after him spent 20 years plotting the position of the moon uh, against the background of the stars. Again, an, an incredibly long time to spend on one task. It was a very laborious task, writing down all the positions of the stars, the results checked and checked again. And of course, uh, not every evening was perfect for stargazing. Sometimes the clouds would come along, or it would rain. Uh, so they'd need to make observations on many, many nights. But they did have telescopes to help them. All we had to do was open up the roof. What uh, the, the astronomers were, were doing was measuring the time that a star appeared to cross the centre of their telescope. And this would give them a very accurate position for the star. In fact, it's not the sun and the stars that are moving, but the Earth that's spinning round. By looking at how the sun and the stars appear to move, we get a good idea of how the Earth actually rotates. And that's probably the most important discovery astronomers have ever made. It's not the sun and the stars that move, it's Earth. In fact, our world never stops spinning. The spin of the Earth is what makes our day. One complete rotation takes 24 hours. It was time to meet someone who'd been far enough away from the Earth to actually see it spin. Britain's first astronaut is in space. The Soyuz spacecraft carrying Helen Sharman and two Soviet cosmonauts was launched successfully this afternoon from the Baikonur Space Centre in the Soviet Union. Helen was selected out of 13,000 applicants by what used to be called the Soviet Union to join one of their missions to space. She had to train for a year and a half for a trip which was to last only eight days. Hello, what are you doing here? Hi. Nice to see you, sit down. Thank you. Where do you think space begins? Space doesn't really begin. The air gets thinner and thinner and thinner until really then there's not very much left. I felt I was weightless. Well, that was when we stopped accelerating away from the Earth. The rocket was just the beginning. It actually took two days to reach the space station. Looking back down on the Earth, I could just about make out that the Earth is curved, because I was only quite close to the Earth's surface, only 200 miles above the Earth's surface. When I mean, you think that the moon, well, is 238,000 miles away, it wasn't really very far away from the Earth at all. When I was weightless, there was no force left to tell me up from down. So the roof of the space station doesn't really have to look any different from the floor. My sleeping bag was tied down to the wall. It means that you can use it everything, all three dimensions of a room. It was very easy for me to move from one side of the space station to the other. All I had to do was push off from one wall and I would float to the other end. We don't really swim like we swim through water either because the air isn't thick enough to push it away. Being a research cosmonaut meant I had to do experiments on seeds and plants and also grew some crystals. But other responsibilities were I mean, monitoring the surface of the Earth and I also had to look at how radiation from space affected the outside of the space station. But the biggest problem we had though was that things, well, they would float off if you didn't tie them down properly. So if you go looking for something, you don't just look downwards, you have to look all around. It was very Russian food. So instead of eating things like cornflakes and toast for breakfast, we'd have 
packets of dried cabbage soup, um, dried meat and potatoes. And to these packets, we could add hot water and reconstitute the soup or the meat and potatoes. The funny thing was, of course, that the food didn't sit down at the bottom of my stomach. You can feel it sloshing about, floating around inside. Drinking could be quite fun as well. If we just opened up the valve, then pressurised water would come straight out. And those water droplets, I mean, they're not drop shape like they are on Earth, but they're round balls, they're pure spheres of water. the only thing to come down from space. This is Glatton, a small cosy village in Cambridgeshire. Not really the kind of place that you'd expect to find a visitor from outer space. Well, I was working in the garden and uh... I heard this awful noise. I'd never heard anything like it before. I saw the top of a conifer tree just quivering as though something had just clipped it, just hit it. So I knew that it had landed somewhere there. And then I noticed that part of the hedge had been damaged. And looking underneath the hedge, I saw this piece of black rock. Now I thought, well, this is what I'm looking for. It must be what I'm looking for. What Arthur Pettifer didn't realize was that he was holding a meteorite, a piece of rock from space. It was to become known as the Glatton meteorite. When I think that, uh, that this meteorite came over a million miles and landed in my garden. Well, it's unbelievable. Meteorites fall all the time. You, you're just not aware of it. Collectible size ones, fist size ones, you get um, several tens to several hundred every year, but they fall at night. They fall in the desert. They fall in the ocean. So they're not seen. They're not collected. Monica works at the Natural History Museum in London. The museum has the largest collection of meteorites in the world, as well as a laboratory to work out exactly where they came from. We examined the Glatton meteorite. We looked at a thin section of it under an optical microscope. And from that, we learned what minerals were present. Just from actually looking at the surface of the meteorite, we could see what sort of texture there was there, which gave us a, a, a big clue as to what type of meteorite it was. And then we looked at the section in the scanning electron microscope, which gave us the, the chemistry of the minerals that were there, which told us what elements were present. And from that, we could classify the meteorite. Well, glatton is a type of meteorite called an ordinary chondrite. If you want me to go even further, it's an L6 ordinary chondrite. Um, it's a type of meteorite that's believed to come from the asteroid belt. And the asteroid belt is over 500 million kilometres away. It's made up of huge rocks drifting in space. Some are thousands of kilometres across, and if they crash into each other, they can get forced out of the belt. If they make the journey to Earth, they're called meteorites. But the asteroid belt is only part of a more complex system. Circling round our sun are nine planets. Together they make up what's called the solar system. All the planets, including Earth, are orbiting round the sun.
The sun is a huge ball of very hot gas. At the centre, 15 million degrees centigrade. It's a continuous nuclear reaction. Some of the energy that generates leaks out as light, other forms of radiation and heat. The planet nearest the Sun is Mercury, so Mercury is incredibly hot. It has a strange spin compared to Earth, so the Sun would look something like this. After Mercury comes the planet Venus. Venus is in fact covered with acid clouds. But underneath, violent storms rage constantly across its rocky surface. After Venus, the third planet away from the Sun is our world, planet Earth. Two thirds of the Earth's surface is covered in water, and yet the land is home to five billion of us. It's the only planet with an atmosphere that can sustain life. This is Earth seen from the Moon. While the Earth's going round the Sun, the Moon is actually going round us. Its surface is covered in craters made by meteorites. They'll always be there because the Moon has no weather to wear them away. For the moment, it's the only place besides Earth we've stood on. That was over 20 years ago. Trips to other parts of the solar system may take another 20. But what exactly is a year? Years are calculated by the time it takes the Earth to go all the way round the Sun once. And that's just over 365 days. In fact, a year. But years mean more to us than that. Seasons come and go. They represent landmarks in our lives. For most of us, birthdays happen once a year. But not for Lizzie and Nikki Parks. They're 12 and twins. Their actual birthday only appears every four years, in what's called a leap year. So why do we have leap years? We have leap years because the Earth is around the Sun once every 365 and a quarter days. Instead of having a quarter days, every four years they add on another day, which is the 29th of February, and luckily for us we were born on that day. And that explains why they're having a kiddies party. I was born in 1980, you see, and I only had three real birthdays. The reason we've got our three-year-old cake is to say that we're three, really. We're celebrating our third birthday, our real birthday. Might as well make the most of it. So if a year is the time it takes for the Earth to go right round the Sun, how long would a year be on one of these outer planets? That is related to how far away they are from the Sun. Pluto is on the very edge of our solar system. It's so far away from the Sun, it takes 248 Earth years to go all the way round. Birthdays here would be rare, probably not worth a visit. But spacecraft from Earth have already passed through this part of the solar system. Even though there was no one on board, this one sent back pictures of Uranus, a huge, cold, gassy planet. This spacecraft was called Voyager, and the close-up images it sent back have made many of the planets seem much closer than ever before. Like the planet Neptune, four and a half thousand million kilometers away. No one ever had the chance to study it in so much detail before. On its journey, Voyager had brought other surprises. The famous rings around Saturn can be seen from Earth, 
but even the most powerful telescopes couldn't reveal what Voyager discovered. Until it flew right through the rings, we had no idea how thin they are. And even closer to us is Jupiter. It's huge, the largest planet in our solar system. Voyager took these pictures of a vast swirling storm the size of our Earth, which has been raging there for over 300 years. All these remarkable pictures were sent back to us using radio signals, but the distances are so great that the signals are very, very weak. They're so weak, we, on Earth, need huge dishes to receive them. And then the real work begins. Astronomers use the information from spacecraft like Voyager to test their theories about space. Some used to believe there was a possibility of life on another planet, the planet Mars. By landing an unmanned spacecraft there, that theory was proved wrong. Although Mars has a thin atmosphere, it became clear that this planet could not support life. But could there be life beyond our solar system, in other solar systems? I don't think there's life in our solar system apart from ourselves, but I do believe there is life in other solar systems. Up there I saw loads of stars, millions and millions of stars. If on our small star, the Sun, we have all of us and all of the life that we have on our Earth, I'm convinced there's life around other stars somewhere. We've come a long way since we first began to understand the stars. That knowledge has taken us all around our own world and with Voyager even further to the edge of our solar system. Now it's leaving and heading off into the unknown. Perhaps the spacecraft will enter another solar system similar to our own. So who knows who it will meet next?